So your challenge right before the break was to make your device play a sound. And what you should have done, I think everyone figured it out, well, you needed to use the right code. But the little catch is at the very beginning of the documentation, it says, remember, install that plugin. All of these features of pop-ups and dialogues and sounds and splash screens and all of that, all of those have to be activated. All of these plugins that we see in the documentation section, most of these we have to activate them. We don't get access to these things right away. In older versions of Cordova, it was the opposite. Everything was activated and you just write the code. Well, that was a little detrimental because if you had all of these things turned on and you don't need it, you're taking up space and memory and resources from all of these things you're not going to use. My app maybe never has to access the contacts, and my app is not going to access uh, you know, the media capture, but all of its code is in your app taking up space. So nowadays, nothing is activated except for the whitelist, and you have to manually go in and activate what you need. And the whitelist, we'll talk about it later, which is a way uh, to approve certain websites and stuff to run on your device from your app. So the big idea is when you want to use any of these, you have to first activate the plugin. And all of you seem to have figured it out that it's in the config XML file. Mm -hmm. In the config XML file, right on the root of your project, you have to go to plugins and find the right plugin and then activate it. So once your config has the right plugin, then you write the code. So it gives you plenty of code examples, and we saw that for us here, navigator.notification.beep. The device plays a beep sound, and the way it works is very simple. Navigator.notification.beep, then an argument of times, the number of times to repeat the beep, and it's a number. It's not in quotes, it's not a string, it's a number. It's a whole number. And so here I'm the example is make the app beep twice when the app loads up, for example, or a button press or something. The code is there in explanation, but it also tells you this code works on these devices, which is basically all of them. So writing this one code, and if it worked on your Android, it'll work the same also on an iPhone, or a Blackberry, or a Tizen phone, and so forth. Although oftentimes there are quirks from platform to platform. This one says for Android, Android plays the default notification ringtone that the user specified under their settings. So if the user put in a, a ringtone sound of La Macarena, that's what it's going to play two times. So you cannot control that, what sound it will play uh, through this. You can control what sound to play in a different way via media. So this will just play the generic like warning sound that is on the person's device, and that might be good enough. But if you need to control exactly what sound to play, it's going to be a different plugin. Uh, so this one, this one was this one was all part of the notification, the dialogues, plugin. Uh, so then, in my example, I simply went then to my index.js file because all of this that it gives us is JavaScript. So in my project, I've got a folder of scripts, index.js. My JavaScript will go there. And I said previously, any of the code that we write from Cordova must be inside of the on-device-ready function. Uh, the app is going to load on the device, and then it's going to eventually tell the system device-ready, which is line 8. And then we can do everything inside of on-device-ready, and I had it here to simple copy and paste. When the device is ready, let it beep twice. And that's what this did. It beeped twice. The, to customize it, this doesn't give us that much customization. We can put the number of beeps, but if we want a specific sound, we have to use a different plugin. It's the media plugin. Yes? So I got an error on mine and said cannot read property beep. You have to confirm that you installed the plugin of notification. If it doesn't understand beep, it means it can't quite find the plugin. For the moment, if it doesn't quite work, that's okay. We're going to try it with a different plugin, and then we can fully confirm if it's working or not. So 
Um, that was one of the most basic plugins. It just makes a beep. Let's get a little bit fancier and activate the camera. Uh, on our app, let's set up a way for us to take a photo from our device. So on the documentation, Cordova documentation, let's find the camera um, chapter. So you're going to spend a lot of time on the Cordova website to read how does it work, what do I do, examples, and so forth. Let's go to camera. <coughs> Scrolling down, okay, this defines the global navigator.camera object, which provides an API for taking pictures and for choosing images from the system's image library. So the jargon that you hear over and over, global object. So basically we have, we can access the object to take photos. We can access the camera of a device uh, with various methods. Which provides API, which provides an API for taking pictures. So an application programming interface. It gives us a way for us to write code to then interface with something else. The something else is the device itself, the raw, you know, the glass, the sensor of the device. Also, it lets you retrieve an image from the library. So whatever photos the person has already taken, we can use the same code to retrieve a photo that they've already taken. In the most basic way that it works, uh, navigator.camera. Step one, it says installation. Before we go further in our code, let's install the camera plugin. So this doesn't mention how to do it in Visual Studio. It tells you how to do it in the command prompt. You already should know then in Visual Studio. Go back to Visual Studio. Config XML file. So from your Solution Explorer folder tree, config XML. Plugins. Find camera and install it. should be near the top, camera, add. Okay, so while that's doing its thing, I'm going to go back to the documentation. How to contribute. So this is an open source project, meaning uh, different people and organizations and teams all over the world contribute to it to improve it. If someone has a lot of experience in this programming, they can figure out how to make it more efficient or, or you know, contribute. So here it says, if you would like to help us make this plugin even better, there's a way here for you to get involved in the team. And you, uh, you can then contribute to a global project that everyone can use. So this whole Cordova thing basically is completely free. Short answer is completely free for you to use on any kind of project and it lets you access the device capabilities. Keep scrolling, there's an iOS quirks. We would read that at some point, but it says what happens with iOS 10. So I would read that a little later. Keep going, API reference. So I, uh, I honestly think this documentation compared to some of the other documentation is, is a little bit harder to understand. I think the other ones are laid out a little bit better, and this one, if you don't have someone to tell you, I think it's kind of confusing how this, how this is explaining itself. So scrolling down, okay, camera, camera.getPicture method with a success callback, error callback, and options. It goes on to a long explanation of what the code actually does. So this takes a photo, or retrieves a photo. The image is passed to the success callback as a base64 encoded string or as the URI for the image file. So it's saying you can take a photo from the camera and pass the photo info as, a, as raw data, as a string. Or you can capture the photo after it's already been saved to the device's uh, memory card as an address on the device's memory card. Remember when we were talking about JSON and then when we come back to PouchDB, you don't really store the, the whole raw data in the database. You store a pointer, an address, to the camera somewhere on the memory card, uh, to the photo in the memory card. So it gives us the ability to look at the raw data, which you usually don't want. You want the, the link to the image file. 
camera.getPicture function uh, opens the device's default camera app. So depending on Android, depending on iOS, depending on BlackBerry, whatever, uh, on their device a camera app will pop up. The user then has to know how to use that camera app because it's the one built into their device. We will see, we'll take a photo, and then we have to do something with that result. The return value is sent to camera success as one of the formats, or there's also a, an error. Trying to get the picture, either trying to take a photo or retrieve the picture from the memory card, will result in either a success or an error. And we have to create functions that deal with both of these. If there's an error, we create a function with a pop-up that says error, or contact the developer, or something. If there's a success, we need a callback function that deals with it. Display the photo, play a sound, do something with the result of a successful photo capture. And we have options. So we can say the quality of the photo, the orientation of the photo, uh, save it to the memory card or not. We have a bunch of options that will be explained here. So you can do whatever you want with the encoded image or the URI. You probably heard of URL. Everyone's probably heard of URL. Uh, have you heard of URI? That's like the hipster way of saying the same thing. URL, Universal Resource Locator. URI, Universal Resource Indicator. I forget what it stands for. But they're both there for uh, that tell you this is where this file is at. This is the address to the file. You can display the image in an image HTML tag. You can save it locally, like in local storage, or lawn chair, or something else. Or you can save it to a server, if you've got a server. And it talks about that cameras nowadays capture, you know, 12, 18, 20 megapixels. Very big, high-quality photos. Uh, so just to be mindful of it. This works on all the devices, Android, iOS, etc. We have parameters. So the actual command is something like navigator.camera.getPicture. What I want to do in a moment, what we'll do together is, um, I want the app to load up and I want there to be a button that says take a photo. We'll press the button to take a photo and the camera system will start up. It'll take a photo and then display the photo on screen. That sounds super basic. But obviously, when we create it from scratch, we need to be in charge of all of that. <coughs> Creating the button, the event handler for clicking the button, the code to start the camera, the code to deal with either an error or a success, and then ultimately display the photo. So when you use someone else's app, again, thank them for all their hard work, because they wrote hundreds or dozens or thousands of lines of code. And for us, when we're done, finally, in the three months, we'll, we'll have written a small app, only about a thousand lines. So the big apps are thousands and millions of lines. But when you're your own app developer, you have to deal with it all. What I was saying about the confusion of the documentation is that it says, okay, example, there. But that's so incomplete. There's a better example further down. You just have to scroll a little bit more. Let's see where do they have it at. There's that. There's then a section all about the options, setting the quality and the destination. Keep going. Destination type. Encoding, you can save photos as JPEGs or PNGs. Do you want to do pictures or video? Source type. Somewhere. It's way down here. That one would work. Get picture. So there's an example. I think that one will work fine. If you scroll down to camera get picture errata, uh, take a photo and retrieve the image's file location. Before we use it, let's break down what it's giving us. Navigator dot camera dot get picture. This is a method. It's got the parentheses. Then it's got, in this case, on success function, comma, on fail function, comma, 
and then options in JSON format. Here it's saying quality, colon 50, 50% 50 quality, comma, destination type. It's the address to the photo instead of the raw data. So we're trying to get a picture. There's either a successful capture or a failed capture. It will automatically pick the right one depending on what happened. So if it was a failure, we have to define a function on fail. And automatically some sort of object gets passed into the success. We don't have to specifically pass the object in. It knows to pass an object. Message, for example. And then we pop up an alert, a basic alert. Pop up. Failed because and some message, probably some developer message that is going to scare the user, is going to pop up and tell them some sort of error. So that's good for us to do console output to figure out what went wrong. If it worked, instead it would call the onSuccess function for us. So we would need an onSuccess function to exist. It passes a, an object in. What I also think is a little confusing about the documentation, it should make it obvious that these can be called whatever you want if you define your own function. It, it doesn't have to be called image URI or message. It could be called success, it could be called error. Whatever object you pass in, you just have to use it. That will make sense when we do it in a moment. But on success, we get some result from success. And here it's saying, okay, var image document get element by ID, that should look familiar. We're going to have to create some element with an ID or my image so that we can reference it. And we'll say image.source equal to the address of the photo that we successfully got. So this should ultimately display the photo on screen. Simply by writing this part right here, nothing will really happen because the result happens either in on success or on fail. And these could be called anything you want as well. We're going to call it probably FN photo success, FN photo fail. These can be called anything you want. This is what I'm saying again about the documentation. Up here they call it something else. They called it, uh, where did I see right here? They called it camera success here and camera error. So don't be confused if they call it different things. This is we are defining the success or the failure callback function, so we can call it kitty and we can call it cat. And that'll work as long as we remember to use our, our code properly. So we have to do a lot of setup here than just that simple beep. As I said, I want to have a button to click on to start the camera and then to show the photo on screen. So before we do the JavaScript, I want to write a little HTML. Let's go back to Visual Studio. Let's go to your index HTML. We've got line 18 starts a div container for the main app. H1, another div dealing with device ready. Ultimately, we won't actually need any of this, but let's leave it for the moment. And I've got this explained in another handout. I think we'll be fine if after the, that div line 24, let's create a new element here. Line 24, button. Let's create a button. This has the autocomplete. Let's say take photo. We're going to have a button with a name of take photo. We need to reference this in the JavaScript, so we should give it an ID, so attribute ID, call it BTN photo. We're going to press a button invoke dot get picture and then ultimately display the photo on screen. So let's create an image tag next line. 
source is equal to nothing for the moment. Visual Studio might also pop up helpful messages over here about, hey, you missed something. And we're going to see in a little bit also that Visual Studio gives us a lot of great error checking while we do our typing. I'll bring that up in a moment. So it'll tell you as you're typing it, oh, you missed something, semicolon missing, misspelled, and so forth. So nothing in the source yet because we're going to get it dynamically from taking a photo. But we want an ID so that via JavaScript we know where to put the photo. Let's call it uh, my image. So we've got a button that will start the camera, and then we've got an image placeholder that will eventually display the photo. No source yet, because that's going to be developed dynamically from taking a photo. And then we've got the image ID. So uh, we can uh, go over now to the JavaScript and create some, uh, some elements, that will, uh, some JavaScript objects that will reference these HTML elements. You can uh, view two documents at once also, like in Notepad. Let's say you want to view index.html and index.js. You can right-click index.js and move to a new horizontal tab group if you want to get it side by side. And then for me, I'm getting a lot of cluttered space, so you can, uh, you can unpin, you can auto-hide any of these panels. Um, closing is closing it. You don't want that. You want auto hide. That way it'll go away to the edge. And I want to auto hide these. I'm going to auto hide them. I don't have a lot of space on my screen. But if you want to keep these open, that's fine. So we need to create objects for those. We need to create objects for those uh, HTML nodes. And basically, everything that we want to do, we want to create it inside of the on-device ready. Everything, especially Cordova-related, should exist in the on-device ready. So it doesn't quite matter at the moment, but let's say after this beep, which let's also comment that out. We know it works, so I don't want to hear any more beeps, please. Um, let's just comment out the, the beep. Next line, VAR. LBTN photo is equal to document dot get element by ID. Good old IntelliSense auto completion. Get element by ID. And you can just tab that and it'll fill it in for you. Open close parentheses, semicolon, quotes, BTN photo. Next line, a variable for the for the image. L my image is equal to the same. Document dot get element by ID quotes my image. Next line, we want to set ourselves up so that when we press the button, we start the process of taking a photo. We've got a reference to the button, L button photo. So L button photo. It'll know that I have that object, that I created it, so it should populate itself as you type. And you can just tab dot add event listener. Parentheses, quotes, click. So on the event of a click, when we capture the click event, comma, fn, take photo, 
And you may get a pop-up about all these possibilities because there's the event of click, there's the event of change, there's the event of error. So this gives you a cool look at these possible events that could happen. And the event of a loading and a playing and a dragging and all of that. If this gets in your way, you can press escape on the keyboard. Then comma false. Escape that. So we've got an element, line 23, representing the button. We've got an event listener, line 26, waiting for a click, run, function, take photo. Backing up, you will create the function, fn take photo. So once there's a click, it will run the function. We've seen this before. We'll run a function called take photo, and then inside of that, we will have the example code that it gives us at Cordova. So the other navigator.beep, it as soon as the app loaded up, it started to beep because we didn't have it as any trigger besides a device ready. So when the device is ready, start to beep. That's what line 22 did. Now we want to set ourselves up that we want a result from a click. So we've got the objects defined. And just like Notepad, you can uh, select or, or just click once on an on a, on a element that you wrote and it should highlight it elsewhere, confirming the spelling and such. And I've got function take photo, clicking on that, and it highlights other instances of it. Just for completeness over here, uh, JS objects for the uh, button and the image placeholder. Function that takes the photo and that tries to take the photo. And deals with result. The results. It could either be a success or it could be a fail. <coughs> uh, and that often happens with any of these API calls. We are trying to do something. Take a photo, load the, load the music player, whatever. And there's often those two results, fail or success. We will see this also when we get eventually to PouchDB, which is our database. Try to save the data to the database. Result is either success or fail. So if it's a fail, error message to the user about whatever it was. If it was a success, then a message to the user that says success or so. And lastly, down here, uh, event listener for um, a click upon the button. I'm going to save that. I'm going to go back to Cordova website. Uh, back down uh, where we've got the chapter... Where was it at down here? We'll do the one that, that said uh, errata. I see it right there. Get uh, camera, get picture errata. There's different. It's going to show you different ways to do it, different examples. That they're all going to work, uh, but just to make it easy here, uh, we'll go to the one here that's under the subchapter of camera, get picture errata. This is a simpler example. So this is all of the code that we need, and if we if we take a look, like I said, well, we're trying to take a photo, there's going to be a successful function call or a failure function call plus options. 
uh, there's the function definition. We can copy and paste this all within our function take photo. It should work, although we have to think about scope because those would be functions that would only exist in that scope. Uh, so we'll deal with that in a moment. So here within the camera.get picture, copy that whole example. Back to visual code. And then I'll paste it inside of the function take photo. So that code that I copied from Cordova, I put it all in this one function, and in this case, with this sort of simple app, it should not be a problem. Um, defining a function within a function, it'll just exist only within the scope of the take photo. Generically, use the term on fail and on success. Part of the reason possibly of putting it within this one function is because many of the examples all over the Cordova website use over and over on success and on fail. If we were to put these two functions outside of the take photo function, any function that's trying to use on success will try to call that function. And right now, this on success function deals with a photo. So if I have some other function of a pop up, and that, and that function had a callback called onSuccess. It's going to try to do something about with this photo. So unless you notice that and deal with it, the short answer oftentimes is the example code uh, created inside of the particular function so that its scope is only in that function. So ultimately, I'm trying to take a photo, either success or fail. Success, we, we're not going to need that line 36. We already did that. Uh, line 36 is uh, our own line that we did up here. This example code as is, it probably won't work. But inside of success, create, create an object based on the thing called my image. We called it my image, so it'll create another object and then set the source. So this one I'm going to comment it out. And probably delete it. And then we need to change one thing on line 37. What do we change on 37? In, it's no longer image. The object is not image. It's L, my image. Line 26 defines my object pointing to the HTML node. We're trying to set the source, which is currently empty, in the HTML. We're trying to set its object source to the address of the photo we captured successfully. Change that to my, to L my image. On fail on its own looks fine. It'll do an alert. Very obviously pop up to the user with some message. At the top here, you can go to File, Save All. Most likely you edited the index.html and the index.js, so remember to save all. You can also hit that Save All button. And then keyboard shortcut F5, which is the same as pressing the green arrow. To test it, I like to, on the device, go completely to the home screen. I like to be on the home screen so that I know that the latest version of the app is loading up in the device. If I leave the app running, myself, I sometimes forget, is this the latest version or not? So I like to press home and then do run, F5, or the little green icon. This time, because I've added the, the new plugin of camera and new code, it might 
be slightly slower compile time than my last time, but then subsequent times will be faster again, because I've added new code to the project that has to compile in further times, it's ready to... to yes, the HTML file right over here. Those two lines. So ultimately here, just a moment, I'll pull that back in a moment. So ultimately here, what I see is a brand new button right below the device is ready. I'm going to press that button. It then loaded up the camera. Can you see me right here? So I've got the camera. Depending on my device, I might have a button that says take photo or whatever. On this device, I just tap the screen. So it took a photo. On this device then, there's cancel and check, or cancel and approve. I'll click approve. It goes back to my device, and now my photo is there really big because I never specified the size. There's my cheek right there. It barely fits in the... There's my mouth right there. So I never specified the size of the image. But it did it as is. There's the image on the on the app. We need to refine that. But at the very least, let's pause here. That people get some result. No one having any trouble. Okay. We'll check that one moment. Uh, let me let me help people here. But let me show you this. Uh, Visual Studio has a very good debugger while you're while you're testing here. So if you as you're writing your code, let's see, where did they put it? Window, or is it view? There's a view error list. Try this. I'm, I'll help people right now, but try this. View error list. Visual Studio will scan all of your open files, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, etc. It'll scan all your files, and it'll give you a list down here of possible errors. Um, some of them are warnings. In my case, mine worked, but it looks like I got a problem. Well, they're warnings. The, the project will load all right with a warning, but if I have errors, the project won't work. My project has no errors but some warnings. I'll deal with these warnings in a moment, because some of them say something like unnecessary semicolon on your index file, JS, line 51. Ignore the warnings, but if yours didn't work, look to see if you've got any errors. You can uh, clean up this screen here. If you don't want to see the warnings for the moment, you can turn off Show Warnings. If you got errors, check that screen, and then I'll help you. But let's pause here. How many of you did get a photo, like me? Great. If not, let's take a little pause to get it to work. Thank you. 
Please. Thank you. 
Thank you.
didn't quite work for you, uh, I'll come back to you in just a moment. But you see here this uh, more complex usage of Cordova, where we had the, the simple beep. It did a beep. But here we had to do a lot of setup. We had those HTML elements, then we had the JavaScript elements, and then we dealt with the result. And we will see this several times on success, on fail, and such. Um, let me uh, reiterate the importance of this panel here in, in uh, Visual Studio. Uh, you want to get used to looking at this error list panel. So if you don't have it visible, uh, it's under View, Error List. So this is a dynamic error list that will tell you as you're working your errors. This is much better when we were over at uh, Notepad. You didn't really see your errors until you went over to the web browser and checked the console. Well, there's a built-in error checker here. So view, error list. Uh, you get these different columns, various codes and results and such. And so in my case, I'm going to break these down because we're going to see these several times. Uh, there's this one, code, good old error code T6, T, TS60503. That one is saying here, Cordova JS is not found. You're going to ignore that one. You're not going to be able to get rid of it. That one's always going to be there. Just don't worry about it, because as I said previously in your Solution Explorer, there is no reference to that Cordova JS file there until we build it and it gets put on the device. So you just have to live with that one. There are uh, three over here that you could deal with if you want. It says unnecessary semicolon. And it tells you lines, in my case, 47, 51, and 55. You can double-click these, and it'll jump you right to the right place. Jump Double-clicking that in the index.js, line 47. So this has some superfluous semicolons at the end of these functions. On device ready, on pause, and on resume. They're warnings, so you could ignore them, or you could remove them. You could also click here to get a, another whole screen of documentation that tells you, you know, what that message is. So this goes over to the ESLint uh, documentation, disallow unnecessary semicolons, and it just goes into detail. 
examples of incorrect code is semicolon after a function. An example of correct code is you know, semicolon and such. So that's how you can uh, use this to further help you. Um, these are warnings, so it's okay, but if they're errors, definitely deal with those errors. If I, if I have my OCD in high gear today, I would want to clean up all of those mistakes, but they're not mistakes, they're warnings. So to fix those, right, I would go to that line and then remove that semicolon, and then when you save it, one down. It says, great, no more, no more unnecessary semicolon. Then I can go to the next one. Delete both of those if you want, save it, and those two go away. These other ones about deprecated and such, you can ignore those as well. Be compiled with this for details, you can ignore those. So there will be some of these warnings that you'll just have to live with. They're just warnings. And you can hide those. But on anything that's an error, you definitely want to, uh, want to fix that. So as I'm writing my code and I'm doing stuff, I may get pop-ups that um, or messages down there that will um, trigger some results. Undetermined regular expression literal. So right there I have a stray slash floating around line 47. So you'll be able to double click that and it'll take you to the right file at the right line. If you did get the result, a result is that the photo appeared, and it's huge because I never specified a size. Uh, to kind of work with this very, very, very quickly, well, with a little CSS, we can resize it down to the right size. If we go back to your index.html, just for a super quick fix, there will be better fixes later. But this image is currently being set to display some source dynamically with an ID. Via CSS, we can uh, redefine the look of that a bit. So I like to leave ID as the last one. We'll add the style attribute with 100%. Save all, run it. And at that point, you take the photo, and the image should resize 100% to the size of the screen. Right now, it's 100% size right out of the camera sensor. I want 100% size of the in the container. So we'll see if that fixes it. And we have to do this this dance of writing the code, saving it, and running it. This is why, perhaps, depending on what you're trying to test, it might be faster to simply debug or test in the, uh, in the simulator instead of the device. If you've got an older device that takes a while for it to power up, maybe the simulator built in would be a little faster. And I'm going to give that a try. So, again, I'll pull up the camera. We have the camera, I'm going to tap, took a photo, click OK on that. Brings it back in, and I've got a photo that fits 100% size. So it's not so big it goes off the edge anymore. It's 100% the size of the container. In this case, it doesn't go edge to edge because there's other stuff of CSS in the way. But I should now see a version of that smaller. I can take another photo. And we saw a moment ago that if I take a photo of myself like that and then click OK, now it's not so big. It fits in the screen because 100%. And if I go sideways, it'll be a little larger also because that's 100%. Dynamically, Looking at the DOM Explorer here, right after I took a photo, you might have noticed that it popped up here for a moment. Now the source is no longer empty. The source is being set to a location on my device, a temporary JPEG that I took a photo. 
So this DOM Explorer is dynamic like a regular website. And as I take different photos and click OK, see that changed. It highlighted for a moment and it changed to a different photo. So there's a file on the device in storage, emulated, temporary, in the Android system as part of my app. We never set the app's uh, <coughs> package name. So it's using the default there, slash in the cache, slash this photo. So ultimately, the photo that I took gets shown in the source. Now, I'm going to, here's more beta testing. This result that I'm getting here is happening from on success. I took a photo, and then ultimately I display the photo on screen. I want to trigger a fail. One way to do that is I'm taking a photo. My device has accept or cancel. I'm going to press cancel. That brought me back to my app, and a pop-up happened. And the pop-up says failed because camera canceled. Failed because camera failed. Camera canceled. So this message is what came out in the alert when I canceled. Another, could, another sort of problem could have been somehow the camera crashed. So then on fail would have triggered. It would have taken me back to the app. It would have done a pop-up failed because, and whatever that message, camera crashed. So I forced a fail by canceling the photo. And that's testing it even more. I saw that the unsuccess worked, so then hopefully I think, well, how can I make the fail work? I would read the documentation, or I would try to do different things and make it fail. Let's say after I took the photo, then I wanted to play a sound. Those two beeps that I have, that I commented out, those beeps were happening as soon as on device was ready. Now I want that beep, those beeps to happen after I take a photo. Like Notepad, I can select code and then drag it and drop it. So try this. Uh, move your beep code inside of the on success without the comments. So maybe I'll do a single beep when it takes the photo successfully. And with that same code in the fail, I'll have it do three beeps. So that function could then have one or two or two thousand lines of code. What happens with a successful capture of a photo or what happens with a failure? As the documentation said, okay, after you capture it, then it's up to you to do something. Simply here, display it. When we learn about the database and PouchDB, we could then be saving that in the database. We learned about local storage. If you can remember how local storage worked, we could use local storage to save the photo to local storage. But again, all of this Cordova stuff is pieces of a puzzle. How do I take a photo? Here's the code, here's the example. But then what, what is it? What is it meaningful for my own app? Here's the code to make a uh, sound, but how is it meaningful for my app? So I'm going to do save all and run. I expect that I'll take a photo. It'll bring me back to my app, display the photo, hear a sound, one, one beep. If I try to do fail, then it'll be three times. And again, I recommend as you're doing this testing and debugging, go back to the home screen before running it so that you can see the latest version load up on the device.
So let me just check mine and then we'll go on. Seems like a lot of cameras are working. Here we go. So uh, mine's loading up. I'm going to do the take photo. I'm going to take a photo. I'm going to click a approve. So it showed it on screen and it beeped. One beep. Question, Mike? <laughs> question? No question? OK. So if that works, what I want to do here is one more thing, and then we'll wrap up. OK, this is working. It's taking a photo. It's playing a sound. Uh, let's see how the feature of vibration works. I'm going to take a photo, and I want it to vibrate as well. Back to Cordova website. There is a vibration chapter over here. Let's go look at how vibration works. This is a simple one. It's very close to like beep. Vibration. So this deals with that spec. Great, etc. etc. Installing. Okay, we're gonna need to install it in the config file in a moment. And then the actual code standard vibrate. Navigator.vibrate time. Time is milliseconds and it's a number. Example. Navigator.vibrate 3000, which is three seconds. Over with um, Android and Windows only, you can actually do a vibration pattern. So as an array, we can say navigator.vibrate array, vibrate one second, then one second, then three seconds, then one second, then five seconds. So we can have a sequence of vibrations for some feedback. But basically, navigator.vibrate. This won't work until we install the plugin. Let's go back to Visual Studio. Let's go back to your config XML file. So in your solutions, config XML. You need cordova-plugin-vibration. Plugins, vibration, and this is one of the uh, ways that beginners forget right away. Why is it not working? My code, I double and triple checked it, and it's just not working. I copied and pasted it. It's not working. We often forget as a beginner, you didn't activate the plugin. These are like permissions. Do you ever go to the App Store? You download an app, and it says, this app would like to use your camera. This app would like to use your contacts. And then when you click OK, the app will have access. Well, these are the permissions. So you might think, OK, I'm going to forget, so I'm going to turn them all on. Well, if you turn them all on, it's taking up more resources in your app. And when you turn them all on, it will also ask for too many permissions when a person tries to download it. When a person's going to download your app, it's going to say, this app would like to use your camera. This app would like to use your contacts. And if you're making an app like, uh, you know, a calculator, why is this app going to spy on me with a camera? Why is this app going to record me? Right? It's going to say, this app would like to record audio. Well, why is this calculator asking to record audio? So you don't really want to turn on any of these plugins that you're not going to use. They take up resources, they take up memory, space, all of that, and they're going to scare your users when it says this camera would like to record audio on your, you know, on your comic book app. Yes? Is there like a checklist somewhere where it tells you like different genre of apps, like, like some of the like standard plugins and all Not quite. Uh, that would be nice. Um, we could search for that, but I don't think there's a place like that that it, it just... I you would know, think for like a website, you know, the standard of the thought research and context. So yeah. that, it's something like that for mobile apps. I think there's just so many kinds of apps that it might be hard to compile a list, but okay. I could see like, okay, any kind of app that's about social media usually asks for these. Mm -hmm. There might be some sort of a guide or repository like that, maybe even somewhere in the documentation of 
AndroidDeveloper.com and, and that sort of thing. So basically think about it in terms, does my app need to do this? Does it need to do this to function? If it does, then you want it. If you don't think you're going to use it, then don't turn it on. Uh, so uh, I added the plugin and then I need to go to the JavaScript and I'm going to say that after a success I don't need it to beep anymore, I want it to vibrate. Navigator dot vibrate a number data type in the argument, so not in quotes. If you quote like 1,000 quotes, that's not going to work. It's got to be a number. 1,000 milliseconds, one second. So here it's going to do a one second vibrate. Error message, error sound. I could do navigator dot vibrate I can get fancy here. In 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 array notation, so several items at once in sequence. I'm gonna first have it uh, vibrate for one second. So one thousand. If I want it to vibrate for half a second, what value is that? Five hundred. Then I want it to vi vibrate at three quarters of a second. What's that? Seven fifty. And I'll do a vibration for five and one quarter seconds. How many milliseconds is that? <laughs> five thousand and two hundred fifty. So five thousand milliseconds, five seconds, one quarter of a second, two fifty. So this is going to do an interesting pattern of vibration if there's a fail. If there's a success, it'll be one simple one second vibrate. So uh, by now you should have turned off that vibration sound and just focus on the on the vibration. You could have it do the sound and the vibration, although this will happen in sequence. Unfortunately, they're not simultaneous. Uh, if you needed it to beep and vibrate at once, it will actually beep first, and when that's done beeping, then it'll vibrate. Uh, unless, unless we do ways to set this up asynchronously, it'll do it in, in sequence. First a beep, then a vibrate, or a vibrate, then a beep. And reading the documentation, the pattern only works on Android and Windows Phone. Uh, we, are, we aren't able to do a vibration pattern on, on iPhone. Uh, I'm not sure. I'd have to read it again to see what happens on iPhone with this. Maybe it'll just take the first one, and then the rest will be ignored. Save that. F5. So cancel vibration, not supported in iOS. There's a way to stop the vibration if you had one going on for five seconds, for example, uh, and then you needed to stop it for some reason. We have uh, navigator.vibrate0 or navigator.vibrate empty array, but that's not supported in iOS. There's this old way to do it, deprecated. You should ignore code that is deprecated. It's not the most modern code anymore, so you don't really want to use it or learn it. Those are examples with old code. Okay, so the app loads up. I'll take a photo. I'll take a photo. I'll click the check mark. Can't hear it, but vibrate. I'm going to do that again, and this time cancel it. Cancel it and go back. So there it is and doing different sounds. Depending on the tablet, I don't think these have vibrate. These ones probably don't. So depending on the tablet, some vibrate, some don't. So this might be a reason why we might do both. We might do a simple 
uh, beep and a vibration. If we're relying on vibration but some devices don't have vibration, that's an issue. So having a beep and a vibration to cover the bases. Or just the beep, yeah, just in case. Uh, if their volume is down, however, they won't hear the beep. So that's always the tricky thing. We don't know how the user's device is set up, so sometimes <laughs> redundancy is useful. But um, There's no way to first read the, the system settings and then There is. We would be able to use the right code to first check status, various statuses of the device, and then based on that, if else, case, whatever, then do a subsequent operation. So this is, uh, we're, we're, this is what we're going to use then uh, with our project to uh, make it do meaningful things. We most likely on Tuesday we're going to get back to our project, to our CBDB project, I think taking a couple of days to kind of look in general. Here's Visual Studio, here's our workflow. We've got to remember to do the plugins and we've got to remember to do the driver and blah blah blah. Once we kind of figure that out then it's just back to the usual writing the code. So most likely on Tuesday we will continue with CBDB with the different screens and start to work on on, on capturing the the properties of this uh, database objects. Ultimately as I said with CBDB I want to be able to save a comic book and it's gonna have fields of the name of the comic, the year, the publisher, notes, whatever for fun, take a photo of the comic and scan the barcode of the comic and other things. So those other things are going to be via Cordova. With camera, with navigator.getPicture, we take a photo. We're going to then, of course, cover PouchDB, the database, to save this stuff. Because this photo right now is kind of floating around. It didn't really get saved. We did not use the option from the example to save the photo. It was just floating around in memory. Uh, the documentation here says you need to activate the option to save it to the camera memory, the memory card. We didn't, so it went away as soon as I closed my app. Um, where is it at? Uh, target with media type. Save to photo album. We need to add the save to photo album option. We can practice that very fast, then we'll wrap up. Save to photo album, it's Boolean, meaning true or false. So when we had our options over here, we took a photo, quality of 50, comma, destination type. All I need is the address, not the raw data, comma. Save to photo album in that specific spelling. colon true. With that extra option in our get picture method, the photo will get saved to the device. A moment ago it was not. It was just going away after we quit the app. It was only resident in memory. So then doing that we have to deal with reading if that photo exists and loading it up. Um, we have to deal with, we're saving photos to the person's device. Are we going to use up their memory card? And all of these other concerns now, when we have to deal with a person's device. Over the weekend, I hope you, you try to set up the software on, on a computer, and unfortunately it does happen that people have a lot of trouble. These computers are all set up perfectly fine. You know, I came in and tested them out myself and they work here, but they're all exactly the same. When you go home and try to do this yourself, you will probably have snafus. So I've got a handout for you that I put in the in, in, in the network folder last time. Right? I've got the um, step zero and step one and step for the Mac. I would try those out at home over the weekend See if you can get those to work. If not, you might have to rely on using our computers or bring your system, your laptop. Uh, we'll try to figure it out in here. We'll try on the via email, although that's a little harder because you can't see your system. 
We'll try to set yourself, we'll try to set you up for this to work at home. This is going to be best if you can continue to practice this on your own time. And the very last thing that I did here, <coughs> save to photo album. So I'm going to take a photo, click OK, it did the vibrate, it saved it there, then I can quit the app for a moment, go over to my photo album, my gallery. In my gallery screen, the very last photo that I took was of the, of the manual on my desktop, on my desk right here. So adding that extra save to album actually then saves it to the device. And notice that is in pseudo JSON format. It's almost JSON format. It's something colon something. It's inside of curly braces. It is an object. Uh, a JavaScript object, but not in JSON format. Uh, it should also work in JSON format with quotes. We've got the first one, comma, the second one, comma, no final comma, save to photo album. And in my library, I see it right there. So I did save the photo. Victor, I, I did follow your instructions on the Windows system for mm -hmm. the installation of Visual Studio. It works. Although it took a really long time, not a cup of coffee, but a lunch break, plus a couple of cups of coffee for me. And then it ended up uh, where it got all through the process, and then it said, oh, it failed. Hmm. And then there's an option where you can select repair mm -hmm. the installation. I chose that option, and then it, it did some more stuff, and it fixed it. Oh, that's very odd, but ultimately it, it worked, but yeah. yeah, that's odd. I have tested it on a variety of systems, and on some, on some it just goes seamless, and on one that I was testing a couple of days ago, it also took like three hours, it felt, for it to fully set up. So I recommend all of you try it and see how it goes, and worst case scenario, you can work in our labs with our tablet, and you'll get a result. But if you can do it at home, on your own hardware, even better. When we come back next time, we'll start with, uh, we'll continue with our CBDB project integrated to this uh, template. This test file was another test file. It doesn't matter. You can keep it if you want. If you want to keep it, it's it's going to be inside of the My Documents folder. Or if when you created the project, when you created the project, there was an option when you went to File New Project. There was the option to save it on your flash drive. If you didn't, if you want to keep this, and you didn't save it anywhere special in the beginning of the day, it ended up somewhere in your Documents folder, Visual Studio folder, Projects, plus the name of your folder. So probably here, minimizing, if you go over to computer and probably documents on the left. So desktop library documents. And here I see Visual Studio 2017 projects. And there's the blank project I was playing with. At the moment, that folder is about 22 megabytes. Everything that we've got so far in the project, it doesn't really do that much, and it's 22 megs. But when we convert it, when we compile it for the final debug release, it does go back down really small to probably about one megabyte, two megabytes or so. So even when we finish our whole complete project, it's less than, it's definitely less than five megabytes uh, from previous semesters. So it's pretty efficient to create apps that are not that big unless you're doing lots of graphics and lots of multimedia. These plugins ultimately compress pretty well. But you'll need to have some space on your flash drive to take your work with you. General questions what we talked about? Okay, we'll do a little lab time until 9.30 in case it didn't quite work, and we'll do it again next time.